The exhortation today will be provided by Brother David Stanley. His subject will be the greatest commandment. And in pre preparation of his remarks, he's asked that we read uh, Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my, name, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall, be, shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter until the kingdom, into the kingdom of heaven. So let us turn our attention now to Brother David and his remarks titled, The Greatest Commandment. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope y'all weren't <clears throat> concerned. We're going to read the entirety of chapter five. Uh, actually, if time had permitted, it'd have been great to read all of this sermon, which runs about two and a half chapters. And what was the greatest sermon that's been ever uttered upon this earth? Jesus so impressed the mass of people who heard him speak that in the Gospel of Matthew, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You see, Jesus taught people, these people, biblical principles that they'd never heard before. There were new standards of personal conduct that had been ignored by the scribes and the Pharisees, those self-appointed custodians of the Mosaic law who had neglected the spiritual welfare of the people. And then Jesus pointedly reminds them, saying, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, 
hypocrites. For you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. See, the things taught by Jesus in this Sermon on the Mount as we've come to, to know it, they were for the edification and the refinement of the human character. And he commanded his hearers uh, things like hunger and thirst after righteousness. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Be peacemakers. They were to judge not, lest they be judged. They were not to exact an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in retaliation, but were to love thy neighbor as thyself. And they were to be merciful and forgiving and, and gentle and prayerful. They were to be pure of heart and always aiming to do God's will in their daily lives. And, and so throughout his three and a half year ministry, his message was focused on preparing the people for the coming kingdom of God. His purpose was to do the will of God and develop and reflect his character, his father's character. And those that would be, as we know, in him, in Christ, must strive to do the same. So this was the teaching that Jesus was bringing to the people, his focus. And when we come to the 22nd chapter of Matthew, uh, we come across this very well-known account where Jesus is rebuking the Sadducees. And he's doing so because they are, their disbelief in the resurrection. And so, starting in verse 37 of Matthew 22, what, are we having challenges? Okay. It says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked them a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now I want you to think about that question for a minute. The teacher, he goes, teacher, which is the great commandment? Jesus could have simply responded, love God, love your neighbor, or love man, period. But he didn't do that, did he? He answers by quoting, we know from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It seems almost extravagant in the intensity of the way that he expressed it. Your mind, your soul, your strength. He's saying, we must love God with every fiber of our being. It echoes the description of, of King Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 23, who is said to have transcended all the other kings and that he sought the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might. Well, back to Matthew 22, Jesus then adds his own words to elevate the commandment even higher than, than that question even required. See, the question was, which is the great commandment? Jesus says, this is the great and first or foremost commandment. So the first thing that 
he tells us surrounding this commandment of love of your neighbor as you love yourself. So surrounding that, the first thing he says is the commandment to love God is the greatest and foremost thing in the entirety of Scripture. Jesus says the most important thing that you can do is love God. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength. And then the other aspect surrounding his command to love our neighbor is what follows on in verse 40. I think we have it there, yeah. In verse 40, 40, he says, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what he's saying is everything in the Old Testament, in some sense, hangs on these two commandments. The commandment to love God and the one which is like it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. I want you to kind of think about Ephesians chapter 6, the, uh, the full armor of God. You remember that? We put on the belt of truth first. Our understanding of his promises. Who God is. His plan and his purpose. We're told to watch our life and our doctrine closely. We put on our belt of truth first. And then all of our other spiritual armor hangs from that belt. Hangs on our understanding of truth. And on these two commandments, Jesus says, hang the teachings of the law and the words of the prophets. Just think about the awesome responsibility surrounding this command to love our neighbor. You know, if we're honest, we have to admit that it presents us with an ideal that's kind of hard to attain, isn't it? If you think about it. um, I mean, we might reach a certain level of love for some individuals, like, our spouse, for instance, or our children. But consistently love our neighbors as ourselves? That's challenging. It's challenging for me. A couple of weekends ago, I, uh, I witnessed the full spectrum of mankind's response towards his neighbor. Brother Casey and I were in Chicago for the meal a day uh, director's meeting. And it was interesting. I was sitting back listening to the projects that are underway, all the projects to help these underprivileged communities, to help the um, disadvantaged kids in many cases. And just the passion that these people had. Not just the ones on meal day board, but those that are out in the field. The, the passion, to, the love to help people, it was just inspiring. The next day, Connie, Mariah, and I, we visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I purposely only include this one picture because the the images and the details of the cruelty are just hard to grasp. Love thy neighbor? The full spectrum of mankind's response to his neighbor. Living according to the spirit, on the one hand, according to the flesh. We are commanded 
to love our neighbor as ourselves, it's almost overwhelming. And I say that because when I read the commandment, it, it seems to demand that I almost tear my skin off my body and wrap it around another person so that I feel like I am that other person. And all the longings that I, that I have for my own safety, my own health, and my success, my happiness, I now feel for that other person as though he or, or she were me. Think about that. I, I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's absolutely staggering when I think about it because if this is what it means, and I believe it is, then, then something unbelievably powerful and earth-shaking and reconstructing and overturning is going to have to happen within each one of us. Something that's way beyond the self-preserving, self-enhancing, self-exalting, self-esteeming, all the selves that we have. These human beings like me, it's more than I can do or we can do on our own. It's a transformation. So before we take up that command and try to apply it to ourselves, however, we need to make sure that we fully understand what Jesus is trying to convey. So let's start on looking at verse 40. It says, on these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. Well, first of all, he didn't have to say this. The Pharisee didn't ask it. Jesus went beyond what had been asked, and he said more. He wanted to impress upon those that were in his audience and to us the importance and the relationship of these two commandments as much as he possibly could. He said that the commandment to love God is great and foremost above all else. He said the commandment to love your neighbor as you love yourself is like it. But he doesn't stop there. He says on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, what does that mean? Let's compare what Jesus says here with what he says back in Matthew chapter 7. And then we'll see what Paul says about it in Romans 13 in a minute. So going back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, we're at verse 12. This is what I was taught as a kid as the golden rule. I think we all understand what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think it's a really good commentary on the command to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, in this part of the discourse, Jesus has just said that God will give us good things if we ask and seek and knock. Why? Because he's a loving father. And then he follows in verse 12, therefore, whatever you want people to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, I'll, I'm sure you noticed, but you see that Jesus refers again to the law and the prophets, like he did in Matthew 22. He says, if you do to others what you would have them do to you, this is the law and the prophets. Do you also notice that the first commandment is not mentioned? Loving God with all your heart is not mentioned here. Treating others the way we would like to be treated, he says, is the law and the prophets. Now, 
we obviously have to be really careful here not to take this and, and say, well, Jesus was, you know, mainly a profound teacher of human ethics. And that what he taught really isn't dependent on our relationship with God. I mean, we, we know that. I mean, this, that kind of thinking not only ignores all the other great things that Jesus introduces to us about our Father, it also leaves out the things he said about himself, coming to give his life as a ransom for many, and it ignores the immediate context of the passage. You see, verse 12 begins with, therefore. Therefore, whatever you want people to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So, so the, the text that was preceding that verse that Jesus, it, it shows that he's focusing his teaching on our relationship to God as our Father who loves us and he answers our prayers and gives us good things when we ask him. In fact, I believe that this is the key to how we are able to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So God, in a way here, is upholding the golden rule by the way that he provides for us. Because what's he expect from us? His love for us, and then our trusting, prayerful love back to him is our source of power for living that rule. Now, but still, Jesus does say that treating others as you want to be treated is the law and the prophets. Again, he doesn't say that loving God is the law and the prophets. So why does he say it that way? I believe what he means is that when you see people love others like it's themselves, what you're seeing is the visible expression of the law and the prophets. This behavior among people manifests openly and publicly and practically what the Old Testament's about. It fulfills the law and the prophets. Our love for God comes from in here, doesn't it? But it's not always apparent or, or visible to others, is it? But it does find expression when you show love to others. So loving others is the outward manifestation, if you will, the, or the visible expression, and therefore the fulfillment of what the Law of the Prophets is all about. So there, there's a sense in which the second commandment, to love your neighbor, is the visible goal of the Word of God. Now, it's not as though loving God is not included here, it's, or that loving God is somehow less important. Rather, loving God is made visible and manifest and full when we are visibly, sacrificially loving one another. So loving others is the outward manifestation. So. I think that's why the second commandment stands by itself when Jesus is talking about it, when he says that love fulfills the law. I mean, if you think about it, think about the Ten Commandments. And we, and we likely know this, but we see that the first four are rules that are more connected with our love for God, right? And the last six are more directly related to our duty to our fellow man or our neighbor. Would you ever think about it this way? All 10 of them are covered by the first commandment to love 
God with all your heart, soul, and strength? You see, while it's possible for us to neglect God without having any real harm to our neighbor, we can't neglect our neighbor without offending God. And the way we know that, our, our love for God gets, is tested all the time. And it's important that we remember this passage from, from 1 John chapter 4, where he says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Pretty strong. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Let's look at one other text that points us in the same direction. It's in Romans 13, starting in chapter 8. Paul adds, let no debt remain unstanding. And, and focus on that word debt, because it's pretty powerful. We all, we all understand debt, right? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Did you notice that two times Paul says that the command to love our neighbor is the fulfillment of the law. This is what Jesus meant when he said that treating others as you would like to be treated is the law and the prophets. And here Paul doesn't say that the law is fulfilled in loving God and loving neighbors. He says it's if you love your neighbor, you fill up the law. Again, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is the visible expression, the practical completion and the fulfillment of what the Old Testament was trying to teach us, including love for God. Love for God, our love for God comes through visible expression when we love each other. Or another way of saying it, our love for God finds fulfillment when we love others. And, and we know Paul saw this practical love as utterly dependent on our relationship to our Father. In Romans 8, he says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And he describes us. Those who do not walk according to the flesh, meaning relying on ourselves, but according to the Spirit, our full reliance, our submission to God. So in other words, fulfilling the law, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, is not something that we can do in a vacuum. We can't do it on our own. We can only do it on a complete reliance on our Heavenly Father. So, kind of tying it up, when Jesus and Paul both echo the same sentiment, pretty much, that loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, they're not excluding our love for God and his love for us. They're assuming that's already there. 
with the audience they're speaking to. Now, I would like to, to close with a, a reading from John 15, the words of Jesus. It starts in verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Thank you.